The United California Bank in Laguna Niguel. It's isolated in a town with a lot of money, and its vault is filled with the safe deposit boxes of wealthy locals. It's also allegedly heist-proof. The vault door is fireproof and glass-proof, and weighs nearly a 1,000 pounds. Its time-lock mechanism means that it can't be opened after hours, at least not by law-abiding citizens. But it has a secret that makes a crew of professional thieves travel 2,400 miles from Ohio to rob it. United California Bank. From the outside, looks like an ordinary bank, but on the inside is, is anything but ordinary. Tipster says that there is a $30 million stash, rumored to be dirty money belonging to President Richard Nixon, inside this bank. And that's the background that gets this all going. The mastermind will be Emil Dinzio. Emil Dinzio is the brains. He's the mastermind. He's methodical. His attention to detail is second to none. And he's exactly who you want in a heist like this. So he starts building this crew. And it starts with his brother, James Dinzio. James Dinzio, who's Emil's older brother, is a self-taught explosives expert and he has a gift. And we know he has a gift because he has all 10 fingers. They add a mob-connected alarm specialist to their crew. My name is Philip Christopher, and they call me the super thief. The next member the Dinzios add to the team is Chuck Mulligan. He'll acquire the specialized gear to get the job done without leaving a trail. Busting into safe deposit boxes takes serious muscle. So the Cleveland mob also adds Charles Brockle to the team. He's not just an associate, he's also Phil Christopher's cousin. Once they arrive in Laguna Niguel, they're joined by the last member of the crew, getaway driver and radio man, Harry Barber. So Harry Barber is a nephew. Again, it's mostly a family affair. These are people he's worked with, these are people he trusts. At 10 p.m. on Friday, the heist team heads out. Charlie Mulligan takes his position on top of the hill as we walk down the embankment. For the duration of this mission, he's the lookout. Harry Barber stays back at the condo listening to the police scanner, and he's on standby with the getaway car in case anything goes wrong. Friday, March 24th, 1972, 11 p.m., the Dinzio crew was ready to put their plan their gear and their nerves to the test. The heist starts now. Their first order of business, to cut a hole in the roof to get to the vault below. So once they have the hole cut... Emil and Phil enter the building to look for the vault's silent alarm. It looks like a closed loop circuit alarm. A closed loop circuit alarm can be bypassed by creating a loop that keeps the circuit from breaking and the alarm system thinks that it's still guarding the vault. The next step involves back-breaking work. Before they can bring bags of loot down from the roof, they need to bring bags of sand up to it. The sandbags not only serve as a way to muffle the sound, but also to direct the energy downward as they explode into the vault. The team is ready to blast down through steel reinforced concrete. It's the part of the plan that separates the pros from the amateurs. And if they're not careful, limbs from torsos. So this is the moment of truth. They have these giant sandbags. They placed the explosives in the poles. James looks at Emil, who nods. James flips the switch. Boom. The Dinzio's explosive charges breach the vault roof of the United California Bank in Laguna Niguel, and they're in. They see these 500 pristine security boxes. There was a special tool that was used on this job, and that tool was a snout-nosed hammer in which the end of the hammer was milled to the circumference of the lock boxes. So you place that hammer up against the lock, you take a sledge and you pound the lock through, and then you're in. There's so much money in this place. You know, our hearts are pounding, we're sweating there. 
With less than five hours to go before sunrise, the Denzio crew retreats through the diminishing darkness to the safety of the condo. The team spends all day Sunday debating whether to take the loot already in hand or risk one more night in the vault for more. The guys are on edge, but they listen to the police scanner the whole next day. Nothing. Laguna Niguel is blissfully unaware that their bank is being robbed. They have a great crew and they have a great opportunity, so they make their way back. They just spend the whole night going through those boxes and getting that loot. They found a treasure trove. It's euphoric and sweaty. They gather up as much loot as they can and they get out of there. The heist team has miraculously pulled off the biggest haul of their careers. With sunrise minutes away, it's time to make those millions disappear. According to Emil Dinzio, they got the Nixon millions and more. When I pressed Emil for details, he smiled. It proved out to be a great job. It was $30 million. You know, you can ask for more than that when you're a burglar. And by the time the bank opens on Monday morning, the crew is not even in Southern California. The Cleveland guys are flying home, and Emil, James, and Chuck are heading to Vegas to fence the loot. I recall sometime around mid-morning, my partner at the time says, you know, I just got a call from the United California Bank. There's a hole in the roof. Jim says, don't touch anything. We'll be right down. You knew right then and there this is a career case. Jed Hoover is the boss of the FBI during this time period. Mr. Hoover was a very motivated guy, and therefore he motivated us. Then J. Edgar Hoover gets involved, and the number of agents jumps from eight to 125 in the first few weeks. 2,000 miles away, the crew is confident they made a clean getaway. So when Emil Dinzio gets a new tip, it's too tempting to pass up. They decide to do another heist. This one is in Lordstown, Ohio, at a bank across the street from a GM factory. I talked to Dinzio about this, and I was like, why would you do this at this point? You just got all this money. They decided a haul like this doesn't come around often. Let's do it again. There's a lot of similarities in ammo, method of operation between the two. So much so that it was pretty clear that our players were involved in that bank burglary. I concluded that we needed to figure out how the bad guys got to Laguna Niguel, California. We had identified a large group of people. We asked the major hubs for airlines to run all of these names through their system. We found subsequently the five names we were looking for within a couple of days. The phone records gave us a witness named Earl Dawson, who turned out to be living in Tustin, California, and a friend of Mulligas. I got the call late in the afternoon to check out Earl Randall Dawson. But the thing that really hit me is his place of birth was Youngstown, Ohio. And you don't have to be an FBI agent to say that's a clue. Frank Kelly and his partner go to Earl Dawson's residence and show him photos of the usual suspects. He immediately picks out Chuck Mulligan and says his old friend from Ohio asked if he could park a car in Earl's garage for a few weeks. While I'm talking to him, the phone rings. He picks it up. He looks at me. And he, Just a second, I'll be right with you. He says, it's Mulligan. I said, do you mind if we listen in on the conversation? Mulligan says, hey, Earl, how you been? I got to get rid of the car in the garage. He says, has the FBI or anybody been around? And he said, no, nobody's been around down here. He said, are you sure? He said, no, nobody's come around. And I said, this guy we can trust. Could the car in the garage Mulligan is coming to get rid of be the vehicle used in the heist? Callie tells the FBI bosses that a suspect is coming to him, and he quickly gets a warrant to search the vehicle. They pop open the trunk, and they find ski masks, they find guns, and they find the tools that were used in the Laguna Nigel heist. It was clear that everything in the car, everything in the trunk had been wiped down significantly, with the exception of a fingerprint behind the mirror when somebody apparently was adjusting the mirror. Mulligan shows up. I walked up to Mulligan. He said, yes, the FBI. He said, what? I said, you're under arrest. 
A true professional, Mulligan doesn't rat out his crew. Even when FBI agents locate the condo Harry Barber rented, the heist team isn't worried. They're confident they've made quite literally a clean getaway. That place was wiped from ceiling to floor of anything that could possibly be evidence, anything with the exception of the dishwasher. Five people were identified from their fingerprints on dirty dishes in that someone forgot to push the start button. Fingerprints will get you every time. <laughs> FBI agents in Ohio arrest Emil Dinzio and in a search of his house find rare coins belonging to one of the United California Bank customers. Agents also find cash they can trace to the Lordstown bank job. From there, they focus on the so-called super thief, Phil Christopher. The FBI came to my home, and uh, they came there to arrest me for a uh, probation violation. And sure enough, because I didn't have the phony ID that day when I went on the airplane, they would have never got me. Never would have got me. In October 1972, 215 days after the heist, trials are held for both the Laguna Niguel and Lordstown jobs. For all their meticulous planning, the Denzio crew didn't plan on this. Emil Denzio, Charles Mulligan, and Phil Christopher are convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison. James is convicted and gets sentenced to 15 years. Harry Barber is a fugitive for eight years before he's caught. Whatever happened to what Emil Dinzio insisted were Nixon's millions? After a heist of 20 million, even 30 million or more, only a small fraction was ever recovered. The feds, they recovered somewhere between two and four million. There is a lot more money out there. According to the burglars, it's something between 12 and 30 million. Where's the rest of the money? 